Okay, hi everybody, we're gonna get started. My name is Alyssa Valenti and I'm the interim chair of the Evelyn S. Field Library. So thank you all for joining us today. The library is recognizing uh, National Autism Awareness Month. We're pleased to have Amy Gravino, a college coach and certified autism specialist to speak about a topic that usually doesn't get a lot of attention in conversation about autism spectrum disorder, and that's navigating friendships and relationships. Amy has presented nationally at conferences, professional development workshops, support group meetings, and colleges since the age of 14. After persevering through a challenging grade school experience in a district that wasn't prepared to serve and support an individual with Asperger's syndrome at the time, Amy went on to earn her Bachelor of Arts in English from King's College in Pennsylvania and her Master's in Applied Behavior Analysis from Caldwell College right here in New Jersey. After this, she began her business, ASCAP Coaching. Amy is also a writer, having had pieces of her work published in numerous outlets, including the textbook Special Education, Autism Spectrum Quarterly, the Autism Asperger Publishing Company newsletter, the Daniel Jordan Phil Foundation newsletter and blog, and the official blog of Autism Speaks. She is also in the midst of writing her book, The Naughty Audi, which chronicles her experiences with relationships, dating, and sexuality as a woman with Asperger's syndrome. So please, please join RVCC and the library in welcoming Amy to speak with us today. Thank you so much, Alyssa. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so here we are, freshman disorientation, navigating friendships and relationships on the autism spectrum, specifically in a college environment, since that's the focus. Uh, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me as we get started. Uh, I was diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome at the age of 10. It was the same year that it was first added to the DSM-4, so it was kind of a miracle that I was diagnosed at that time, especially being a girl and knowing that um, men and boys are diagnosed at a greater rate than women. So that was when, when that happened. and. Uh, as uh, Alyssa mentioned, I do have a master's degree in ABA and I've become involved with many different autism organizations over the years, uh, including AHA and Y on Long Island. I served on the board of directors of GRASP until this past year. Um, I've been on the awareness committee of Autism Speaks. Uh, I currently co-facilitate the Morris County chapter of the support group for Aspen. Actually, our meeting is tonight. And, uh, and I just recently joined the board of directors of the Golden Door International Film Festival of Jersey City, which has an autism component in the films that it shows at the festival. So I've been doing a whole lot of things, have my fingers in a whole lot of pies, and I'm very happy to be here today to be able to speak with you. So I want to show you two quotes from people that I was around in high school, middle school, high school, to show you the mindset that I entered into college with. Because a lot of what ends up happening, or at least at the start of when you start college, has to do with the place you're coming from. So the place that I was coming from, you know, being on the autism spectrum, was not a particularly good place. And it wasn't necessarily because of having autism, it was because of how other people reacted to it and how they treated me because I was different and had autism. So one of the things that was said to my parents at one of the many IAP meetings they attended over the years was, let's see if she finishes high school. College is not probable. She'll probably wind up in a sheltered workshop. So this whole idea of low expectations, of thinking that I really am not going to be capable of doing a whole lot, when that feeling is surrounding you, that's kind of what you start taking into yourself after a while. And similarly, I, you know, I had one of my, my classmates say to me, once when I, I think I, I probably expressed that I had a crush on a boy because I wore my feelings on my sleeve, um, like a cuffling. And they said, ew, you're ugly. You're not allowed to like him. And it was this whole idea. It's, 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 it was something that had started back then and it kind of continued through college, this idea of feeling that I needed permission just to exist, first of all, and then be to even have feelings for someone as if somebody who's neurotypical would need permission. Um, so. This was the mindset that came with me to college, this, this idea of having very low self-worth, of not really having confidence in myself, and of desperately wanting validation and friendships, which I hadn't had in high school. Um, so, so here I am, freshman year of college. And off I go, I don't really know what to expect, and I wasn't really homesick. I'll tell you, I did a two-week program the summer before freshman year. It was for students with disabilities, other conditions besides autism. And I was homesick for exactly one night. 
and then I never look back. And so, but even even if you think that you're prepared, even if you think you know, you know how to handle certain things, you you really don't. Um, and so, experience ended up becoming my greatest teacher more than than anything else. So, I'm going to just give you kind of an overview, and I'll go into, into specifics of the challenges that I faced in high school versus the ones that I ended up facing in college. Um, again, another you know mindset is to think. Well, I'll go to college and all my problems will disappear, everything's going to be great, I'll be happy. No, what happens is that, yeah, maybe the things that I dealt with in high school went away, but then they were replaced by new challenges and new problems in college. So some of the difficulties that I faced in high school were bullying, problems with social skills, feeling very isolated, you know, not, not participating in the events and activities that my classmates did, extreme self-consciousness. Um, I, I weighed all of 85 pounds soaking wet and I got teased you know, for being flat chested and for being skinny and it, it doesn't really matter what you look like, skinny, fat, the kids will find something to pick on. But they, they went after me for that for sure. Um, and as a result of that, having really low self esteem and, and a lot of issues with my body image as a result of that, really feeling that I just wasn't a real woman, quote, that I wasn't worthy of, of even being female because I couldn't play that role. And I'll get more into that in a little bit. And then uh, my academics were, were not a problem until my social problems got so bad that they started affecting my schoolwork. So the, the morale of wanting to actually be in school was, was sort of non-existent. I mean, if you're having problems and being bullied, it doesn't make you want to be in that environment. It doesn't make you want to learn. And so that, that was a real issue that I dealt with in high school. And then in college, the problems shifted. They didn't necessarily go away, but social situations become a little more complex. Things become a little different in a college setting. And the problems that I faced in college are, were among these, being naive, being taken advantage of it. I'm going to go into detail with some of these a bit more. Um, having trouble with organization, group work, um, and then the, one of the biggies, dating and sexual inexperience. And boy, are we going to go into that in a few minutes. Um, so these were the things that became problems in college, things that I perhaps didn't even anticipate or know I was going to be facing. But, but that still people tried to prepare me for, like my, my mother, my parents, the, the uh, speech pathologist I worked with in high school. But as, again, as much preparation as you can do, writing things down on a piece of paper, it's completely different when you're in this situation and dealing with these new challenges for the first time. So I want to tell you just a little bit about something called executive functioning. And these are important skills that every person has to have, and particularly when you go to college. So it's this little part right here. So this is the part of the brain that helps with self-regulation and emotional control. That's an important thing that you have to have, not just in college, but in life. All these things are part of life. Um, being able to plan and organize, being flexible. So this, this is the stuff that, that people on the spectrum tend to have a lot of trouble with. And, and it, you know, as much as it can be a problem when you're younger, it's even more so when you get into a college environment and you have to advocate for yourself. You no longer have that structure that you had in high school. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, so when it came to making friends in college, I saw this as, as a beautiful opportunity. I had a clean slate. You're no longer the person that you were in high school, which can be a wonderful thing. Um, and a lot of people, they go away to somewhere. Either they move away or they go to college to be someone else, to be someone other than who they were in high school. I went to college to be myself. Um, I went to college to be the person that I never could be in high school, a person who every time I tried to be myself got made fun of, got bullied, got told, no, that's wrong, that's bad. So all I wanted was to be who I really was. Um, and you know, the issue arose of how do I tell people that I'm on the spectrum? How do I put that information out there? I, I never felt like I, I had to hide it. Um, I wanted to be able to put it out there. That was the whole entire thing. I, I wanted to be able to be open about it and have people accept me just the way that I was, which is what we all want. And um, so when I got into this new environment, here I am, I'm meeting people that are different from people that I'd known before. And we'll, you know, we'll get into that a little more as well. But um, you know, people with different political views, people who live, are, come from different parts of the country. I'd never known anybody from Ohio before going to college. And now I'm meeting people from Ohio. and. Oh, you actually know what cell phones are. Wow, how about that? All right, you're not as in the backwoods as I thought. Um, 
And here is my best friend in college who was a very religious person. I'd never known people who were really religious. I went to a Catholic college and, and my nickname for her to this day still is Mother Superior because when I met her, she was this close to becoming a nun. Um, and so, but, but the thing about meeting her was that we live on the same floor of the girls' dormitory and what I came to find out was that she has a brother who has Asperger's syndrome. And so she immediately understood me in a way that nobody else did. It was, it was a huge relief, it was a huge blessing. Um, I remember one time we were in this bar in, in, my, in the town where I went to college and it was this very hole in the wall crappy bar um, and they were having a beach theme so they had sand on the floor and it was loud, it was you know, noisy and I was starting to get overloaded and so I knelt down and I started kind of kneading the sand with my hand which I'd always like to do as a child, I like to grab things with, of that texture like flour and it was soothing and my friend looks, Jen is her name, she looks down and she says, oh, Amy's overwhelmed and she knew. You know, maybe anybody else seeing that would be like, what the hell's going on with this girl? But she knew immediately. And so it was a tremendous benefit to have met her um, and to become, she, she calls me her little one. Uh, to this day, that's her nickname for me. And she used to call me her squire because I would follow her around everywhere. And, you know, again, my inability to, to form friendships, to not know how to be friends with someone, I kind of just glommed on to her. And luckily, she decided that that was endearing instead of horribly annoying. So, bless her for that. Um, you know, another, another story I have to share with you is when she came to my dorm room wanting a can of tuna. So I said, sure, I got a, got a can of tuna here. And she, she goes to open it. She takes out a knife and stabs it with a knife. And I'm like, I have a can opener, what are you doing? <laughs> I had never seen anybody stab a can with a knife. And it was so, so talk about you know, meeting new kinds of people, people who are really very different from what you know. And as you, as you may know, you know, people on the autism spectrum, sometimes it can be very hard dealing with new things, new people, new environments. So this was definitely an eye opener for sure. Um, but if I want someone to be accepting of me, then I have to learn to be accepting of them too. To a degree, of course. There's people who are just flat out hateful, awful people that you don't need to waste your energy on. But with this, it was just part of her quirky personality. So that was an, an interesting experience for sure. But um, I didn't really know what it meant to be a friend. Like I said, following her around, being annoying. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I wanted friendship so desperately, but I had not been very successful up to that point. And so I had to kind of learn as I went along and I hope that the people that I would come across would be willing to accept me. And one of them is actually here today. Hi, Billy. Um, <laughs> and, and Billy was part of the group of friends that I met in freshman year, which was also a new experience because I'd never had a group of friends, let alone you know, more than one friend. And so that had its own challenges. Um, there was a certain point in our freshman year when suddenly a bunch of the people in the group became couples. I don't know why that happened, I don't know how that happened, but all of a sudden four of them were dating each other. And Jen and I just kind of looked at each other like, huh, okay, okay, you know. So it was, it was a, an interesting kind of dynamic and then that, that, that feeling of being left out kind of re-emerged all over again. And I, not that I was holding it against anybody, but you know, kind of dealing with that strange sort of dynamic in, in a group of friends, which I'd never encountered before. Um, and then again, conflicts within a group of friends. Of course, you have people with different personalities, people from different backgrounds. There are gonna be disagreements. And up until this point, I had operated under the mindset that everybody has to like me all the time. If we have a disagreement, we might not be friends anymore which is an unfortunate precedent to, to be under, um, and partially came from the girl who had been my best friend in high school, who I am no longer friends with today for a variety of other reasons, but that was sort of how she was, where it was very hard to have a disagreement because she would get angry with me, especially as the years went on. After, you know, when I was in college and I started developing my own opinions and my own sense of self, it was different from hers. And whereas before I'd always taken the lead from her, now I wasn't doing that and it was presenting problems. So, so conflicts within groups of friends were a new, a new thing for me to deal with as well. It was certainly not something I'd encountered before. Um, and as I said, it was a Catholic college, but I don't know how conservative I would say it was because I met some of the freakiest people I've ever known at this college. 
um, one of whom is a dear friend who, at the time, he was studying to be a priest, but we gave him 20 bucks and he went and bought us a six pack of Smirnoff ice when we were underage. So, and at night we would IM pictures of hot guys because he was gay and that was a fun thing. So, um, people are people is, is the thing that I came to learn. And, you know, I, I was fortunate to meet really different kinds of people. Um, and I felt the most comfortable around people who were a little different. And I, I developed in, in sophomore year particularly a group of, of gay friends, particularly these guys who I met from going to the local club. And they came to the dorm one day because one of their friends lived in my dorm. And they came up to my floor looking for me, knocking on my door. And nobody had ever done that before, sought me out, wanted to hang out with me. And it, there was just some, there was a comfort to be found in being around people who knew what it was like to be outcast, who knew what it was like to be different. And, uh, you know, and it's not to diminish the friends that I met freshman year in any way, but perhaps some of them didn't have the same experiences that I did with isolation and bullying in high school. And so to meet these other people really was a, a comforting and wonderful thing for me. Um, and so yes, there is a gay mafia and they're fabulous. They are, they are my friends and I love them. Um, and so it just takes all kinds of people to move the world. And it, it was not until college that I began to see the value of being different. Because up till then, being different, being autistic was always seen as a bad thing. But for the first time, meeting other people who are different and, and having them value what I had to say, that made me see that it's okay to be different. You don't necessarily have to fit in and be like everyone else. And that was not something I'd ever, under, ever believed or felt up until then. So now we move on to the big topic, which is dating in college. Now this, oh boy, <laughs> I could be here all day with this one. Um, so I, I desperately wanted a boyfriend. Up until college, I, I had kissed maybe one boy, but I'd never gone on a real date, and I'd certainly never had a boyfriend. And a lot of young people on the spectrum, they're, they're, they want relationships. They're, you know, there are certainly folks who don't, but for me, I, I definitely wanted someone to be with and someone to like me, you know, because nobody ever has. So I, I, I finally had my first boyfriend when I was 19 years old. Um, we met in a class. He was in the year ahead of me. And uh, I don't remember exactly. We just kind of went on a date, and all of a sudden, we were officially boyfriend girlfriend. And we, I took him to meet my parents. It was my, my birthday dinner, I think. It was right after my birthday in 2002. And so that was when it kind of became official. And he was a big jerk in the end, so uh, photo not available for that reason. But, um, you know, the, the, so the first immediate thought I have when, when I started dating him, and this is largely due to, you know, that idea of, Sometimes individuals on the spectrum can be kind of black and white or can be kind of one extreme or the other extreme. So for me, my immediate thought is, okay, we're either going to break up or we're going to get married. I'm looking ahead because I, I want to know where is this going to go? What's going to happen? You know, are we going to, how long are we going to be together? Like I wanted specifics and that's not what relationships are. That's not how relationships work. And so that unpredictability can be very challenging for, for individuals on the spectrum. Um, letting letting things just play out the way that, that they're supposed to. I, I, I do that now. I've gotten to that point where I'm able to let things just play out now. But at that point, because I had just no experience and you know, I just wanted to know what's going to happen um, because I was terrified of screwing everything up. Um, you know, the, the mindset wasn't, well, he might mess something up. It was, it was, no, I'm the one who has no experience. I'm the one who's never had a boyfriend. I have to do everything right or we won't be together anymore and then nobody will ever want me again. This was, this was the thought in my mind. It wasn't, it was, you know, because this was so new and I, I was so desperate and eager to hang on to it, I didn't want anything to happen to jeopardize it. And, you know, that, that group of friends that I mentioned earlier, they didn't like him. And that should have been a red flag from the start. But again, with, with my so desperately wanting a boyfriend, I didn't listen. I thought, no, no, this, you know, it's fine. He's just a little different. Um, I'm pretty sure that he was on the spectrum himself, but every time I would bring up the subject, he would, he would not want to talk about it. So, but they, 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 they didn't care for him. And that was, again, another new uh, friendship and relationship thing that I had never dealt with before. Having a group of friends who also didn't like my boyfriend. I had no clue how to handle that. I'd never, but this was to become a, a repeating pattern uh, in my life. A few years later, it happened with another guy, not in college. But um, so the, the moral there is listen to your friends. <laughs> they know. Um, and, and it's not to say don't trust your own instincts, but 
sometimes people can see things that you can't necessarily see, especially if you're young and if you're so eager to be in a relationship, it's, it, you might not always have your eyes open in the way that you should. So uh, there were things obviously that I wasn't noticing or didn't know to look for in being with him, and I'll I explain a little bit you know, more about that. Um, but here I was trying to figure out what the heck does it mean to be a girlfriend? And instead of just being Amy and being his girlfriend, I was trying to play the role of girlfriend because we have all these ideas that feed into what we think a, a relationship is supposed to be and what a girlfriend is supposed to be, you know, from TV, from movies. That was where my conceptions of a girlfriend were from, or from the teen magazines that I read. So I, was, I just wanted to do all the things that I thought I was supposed to do, whatever form that came in. Um, laughing at his jokes, even if they weren't funny, being nice to his parents, doing sexual things, all, all that stuff. Um, you know, I, is what I thought I needed to be doing to be a girlfriend. And so, it, you know, but again, if I had just been myself, I think I would have been a lot better off because that's the per I don't want to be a girlfriend. I want to be me. I don't want you dating someone just because they're a girlfriend. I want you dating me because you're, cause you're dating me. But I didn't have that awareness and that concept at the time because I had never dated anyone before and because I had been so lonely and so desperate for a relationship. So problems began to arose, and we'll, we'll get to those in a moment. But there were not all bad things that happened with the relationship. Um, it was a period of self-discovery, which I had never had before. But the first time, I saw myself as a sexual being. Now, why is that so important? Well, being on the autism spectrum, one of the least addressed areas is always sexuality. It's always people who are autistic, they want to have sex, they think about sex, they are sexual people. Parents don't want to think about that, and professionals have no clue how to address that. But it's a fact of life. You know, developmentally, we may have challenges. We may not be in, at the same place as our same age peers in other ways, but our bodies are right there. We, are, we have the same hormones going through us and the same wants and needs, and we need to have those addressed. Um, but that had never been something that I thought anyone would see me as, that, that I would be viewed as someone sexually desirable. I thought it was just never going to happen. And part of that was developing a connection to my own body that I never had. Now, I know it's hard to imagine feeling so disconnected from yourself, but we know as women that oftentimes our bodies feel like public commodities for other people to comment on. People write things on the internet or they say, say things about how you're dressed, what you're wearing. It's, it, it's tough. And, and the challenge is there just as much for women on the autism spectrum. Um, so my body was sort of what, whatever my peers decided it was. If it was ugly, it was because they said it was ugly. I didn't have that sense of self and that confidence to be like, no, what I think of myself and my body matters most, not you. So at this point in my development, in my journey, I, I was getting that validation and, and that feeling from someone else. I wasn't yet at that place where it was coming from within. But I remember one time we were, we were being intimate and I looked down, you know, and I noticed for the first time, I have pubic hair and it has a function and there's a lot of it. It's like the Black Forest. I should do something about that because I'm Italian. And, um, but you know what? The funny thing is that he's Italian too and he was like a chia pet down there, yet I never ha had the gumption or, or believed that it was in my position to say, maybe you could trim that crap a little bit, you know, because I didn't think I had the right. Again, him being more experienced, me deferring to him in that regard and, and not being assertive about my needs because I didn't either understand what my needs were or I didn't have the confidence to state my needs because I was afraid it wouldn't go over well. Um, but that realization, that, that dawning of the fact that I do have the, the power to give someone pleasure, it was, it was a powerful thing when I realized that. Um, because the fact is, when you, when you are with someone and you're doing stuff to them, you're in the driver's seat. Am I right, ladies? You're the one in, in, in control there. As much as they want to think they are, no. You're the one commanding the joystick. That's all, that's all I'm saying. So, you know, I never had had that kind of experience in my life of, of that I could do that to someone. I didn't know that it was possible. And it was, it was an amazing moment to, to, to kind of realize that, that, that sexual component of my being, which had never existed up until then. Um, so, so, so dating this guy, as much of a jerk as he turned out to be, had some really good things to it that helped me with discovering myself and, and going on my journey. Um, but trouble in paradise, 
arose when I met a friend of my boyfriend's. It was not long after we had begun dating, and this guy was unlike any guy I had ever met before. He had green hair, and he had piercings in places I didn't know you could get pierced, and he was, you know, very flamboyant. He was gay. I told myself he was bi so that I would have a chance, but, you know, he was. And uh, he was completely different from my boyfriend. Um, you know, if, if my boyfriend was this wall here, then that guy was like the wall in CBGBs, you know what I mean? Like just completely, completely different. Um, and so I was immediately enamored uh, by this guy. And you know, throughout my younger years in high school, because I hadn't had any way to kind of um, experiment sexually or, or you know, kind of do those things that kids do when they're discovering themselves and having those normal experiences like kissing somebody or just exploring, I, I had to, t I turned internal, and I had a lot of fantasies. I had a very rich kind of fantasy life, and, I, and I'm a writer, and so I began writing, you know, erotic fiction when I was around 14 years old because I had no other outlet for kind of exploring those feelings. And one of the one of the fantasies that I had had, one of the tools I used to explore that sexuality, was writing or well, reading mostly stories featuring two guys, which what's also known as slash fiction. Um, because when I read something that involved a man and a woman, I had to envision myself in the female role, and it was very challenging. I thought, I don't look like that. I don't know how to do these things. I can't do this, and it would get I would get very frustrated. I certainly couldn't enjoy it. Um, I remember being at my grandmother's house, I must have been around 12 years old, and catching like the scrambled porn on the Spice Channel or whatever it was, or even on HBO, like after everybody was asleep. And, and I'm watching, I'm like, what is happening here? Like, is, I don't know, yeah, I don't look like that. I, can, I, I could never look like that. And I was both fascinated and upset because I had these expectations of myself that were expectations that you know come from society and come from Real, thinking this is that there's a certain way that women have to look and behave, and feeling that I couldn't fulfill those roles, so it was it, I felt trapped in that regard. So that's why I had these fantasies. And when I met this guy, suddenly I had an opportunity to have some of these fantasies come to life. Now, we know, as anyone would know, that just because someone you know, may partake in same-sex activities, it doesn't mean that they're just going to do it for your benefit so you can watch. Um, and, and even if they talk about their sexual proclivities, which he did openly, he told me about his exploits and stuff that he had done, it still doesn't mean that necessarily they're open to do that kind of stuff. But I felt that this was an opportunity, and we did engage in what I call pseudo-threesomes, which means that things were happening, um, but nobody was having sex with anybody, but we were all still naked. And there was a better picture that I had to go with this, but I didn't know if it was appropriate for here, which was of uh, Amy Schumer in bed as Princess Leia with C-3PO and R2-D2, um, which is basically an actual representation of what it was like, because my ex was C-3PO, uh, the, the other guy was definitely Leia in the middle, and I'm R2-D2 like taking notes like a machine, like, observing. That was really, that was what it was for me. Like, I, I mean, it, there was titillation to it, but I was very curious on this level and I'd never had an opportunity up till this point to explore those curiosities so um, I'm sure my bewildered boyfriend really maybe wasn't too keen on whatever it was I was asking him to do but he went along with it to some degree um, I remember there was <laughs> there was one occasion where there was another guy involved again nobody had sex with anybody it's very strange to describe but so the three of us are at the bed area and my boyfriend is over on the computer naked at the computer and it was a very awkward kind of situation. Um, I, I, I can't recall anybody doing a whole lot to me. I was really in it to observe um, because I learned by observing. That, that's the kind of person that I am. And so these, these scenarios came up. This was my exploration and my experimentation that I you know, was finally getting a chance to do, which a lot of people do in college. But when you're on the autism spectrum, sometimes you don't have as many opportunities for doing these kinds of things. And Perhaps I wasn't reading the situation in the way that I should have been, um, but they ha these things happened, and for good or for bad, they were what they were. Um, but so the other white guy. So this is this is the guy that I'm talking about. 
what ended up happening with this guy is that he, you know, you have me here, autistic, can't read people very well, and then you have him, who can read people like a book. So he saw the dynamic between me and my boyfriend, which was that I wasn't getting the affection and the attention uh, from him that I really wanted. And so this guy you know, swooped in and he was very affectionate and he was touchy-feely and he knew I had a crush on him, obviously. Um, and so he used that to his advantage to manipulate me to get me to buy him things like food, um, gaming books, um, all, all kinds of stuff. I had a credit card for the first time ever. I'd never had one. $500 limit. Really exorbitant, I know. Um, but he you know, persuaded me into spending this money on him and it drove my boyfriend nuts. Um, I mean, we, we were broken up briefly because uh, my ex dumped me and then we got back together like a few months later. We, we managed to miss all the holidays, by the way. The, the one thing I had been looking forward to about having a boyfriend is, is having a Valentine's Day with one. We weren't together on Valentine's Day. We got back together maybe a month and a half later. Um, and we were also, bro we had broken up just before Christmas. So we missed Christmas, we missed, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but this manipulation that was happening was not something that I was able to pick up on and understand was being done to me. Um, even if I did know, maybe on some deep level, uh, unconscious level I knew, but I didn't care because I, I was so enamored with this person and thought that this person cared about me too. Um, and I just wanted to, to think that he was really my friend and that maybe he, he liked me. But as I said, when Valentine's Day rolled around, and this was when my boyfriend and I were broken up, but at the time, this guy and my ex were, were roommates in the dorm that we all lived in. I lived on the third floor, they lived on the first floor. This guy approached me and he asked me to give him money to go on a Valentine's Day date with someone else. And I did. I gave him the money. I thought, well, I want him to be happy. It's Valentine's Day. And of course, I felt you know, kind of wistful and I felt, I wish that, I thought that he was gonna ask me to be his Valentine and, but, I couldn't convince myself that this person was not doing good things. I, I couldn't convince myself that they maybe didn't have the best intentions at heart. Um, and maybe that was part of the naivete. Maybe it was that I just, I didn't want to believe. Um, but my ex was such a jerk that I didn't want to hear what he was saying either. So I fed, maybe I fed into it on an unconscious level. But at the same time, this guy knew what he was doing. Um, and so, by the way, when I said there was no picture of my ex, I lied. There's one. I'm not going to protect the guilty. Um, and, and the interesting thing about this picture, before I go on to what's on this slide, I want to tell you, I don't know exactly when I did this, but usually, like, if somebody has a breakup, they cut out their ex from the pictures. I cut myself out. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? Okay. That, that kind of is, is ev evidence of the mindset that I think I had for a long time, which is that something goes wrong, it's my fault. I'm the one to blame. I'm the one who's on the spectrum. I'm the one who's, quote, broken. I'm the one who doesn't know what she's doing. So the fact that I cut myself out of this picture instead of him, or maybe I just thought I didn't look good in the picture. I don't know. I mean, you could see we were kind of in our goth wear because I had a goth phase in college and he was in these leather pants. But um, it's very telling, I think, of the mindset that I carried with me through these experiences and of the confidence that I still didn't quite completely have in myself. Um, but so he broke up with me, as I said. He broke up with me because he wanted to date, quote, a real woman, meaning one with breasts, I guess, um, one who actually had curvage, because again, like I said, I was about 90 pounds at the time. And we tried to stay friends for about a month after the, the final breakup. Um, and it was awkward, as I said, because our mutual friend, the guy I, I mentioned before, lived in the, in the dorm we all lived in. And one day, we are all out on the porch of this dorm. It's the middle of the night. And our friend is having a cigarette. I go out to talk to him. And my ex is there and he's like, go away, nobody wants to hear. We don't want to have to hear what you say. Go away, you know, we don't want you here. And I'm trying to ignore him because I'm thinking, you know, I have a right to be out here. I have a right to talk to my friend. And my ex proceeds to slap my forehead with the palm of his hand and kick me in the shin. And for reference, he's six foot three, I'm five foot zero. So it was this very like grade school kind of thing, but it's still assault. You know, immature though it may be, that's technically assault, ladies and gentlemen. So I was kind of stunned that that happened. And a few moments later, my friend finishes his cigarette, we go back in. And um, 
went, not long before this guy and I had started dating, my grandfather had passed away. And while we were together, a gift I'd given him was one of my grandpa's ties. And I hadn't gotten it back from him since our breakup. So I, I said to him, you know, can I have my grandpa's tie back? Obviously, it had a lot of sentimental value. And he's standing in the door of, of his room on the first floor there. And in this really petulant voice, he says, no. And he slams the door in my face. So hard I can hear the screws, screws jingling in the middle frame. And so my friend had gone to the bathroom. And he comes out and he says, Amy, go to campus security. Go tell the RA. I'll back you up. Just you got to report this. Um, the, the assault, obviously. So I said, okay. And I wound up going to the RA, go, going to campus security, filed a report, um, and wound up going to, to court, uh, which I hadn't expected. But I, I ended, up fi ended up filing for a PFA, which is a protection from abuse order. It's like a diet restraining order, basically. Um, and that mutual friend backed me up in court. He backed up everything that I said about what had happened that night. Um, I had I wound up going to the Dean of Student Affairs. There was a, like an on-campus trial kind of thing. And, and the hardest part of everything wasn't even going to court. I mean, yeah, that, that's a pretty heavy thing to have to deal with. But the toughest part for me was when we were at that on-campus hearing and my ex's parents came you know, to, to be there to support him. And his mother wouldn't even look at me. And up before then, you know, she had been a lovely woman, and I had gone to his house in Mount Kisco, which is in uh, Westchester. She'd given me money to go buy an outfit to go to church when we were dating, you know, because I didn't have an outfit for church. And it, it, it hurt that suddenly, you know, his mother hated me, or I didn't really understand what was going through her head. I understand a little bit better now, probably, what was going through her head. But that, that was pretty hard um, to kind of lose, lose that. And so, I won the protection from abuse order. He had to move out of the dorm. Um, no third party contact allowed, no online contact, nothing. Uh, I, and I never you know, spoke with him again since then. Um, as far as I know, he's dropped off the face of the planet. I can't even find him on Facebook or anything. But um, you know, it was just this enormously emotional and stressful thing that I had to go through. And, and even considering myself as being assaulted, considering myself as a victim, I didn't like it. I didn't like feeling like a victim. Um, and, but what I discovered was that I, I had a strength that I didn't even know was inside of me that helped me to get through the entire thing. And so as badly as it ended, the two you know, good things, that, the three good things that came out of it were finding that strength, uh, the fact that my ex introduced me to Japanese food, and the fact that he left me a virgin. So, you know, not all bad. That, that was the two best things he ever did for me. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a really, really terrible thing. And, and the impact of that is what I ended up feeling afterward. It wasn't so much in that immediate moment of going to the cops and having to do all this stuff. It was what happened in the months following. Um, when you have, when you get dumped, it, it sucks. I mean, uh, any of us here who have been dumped know that it can, it can hurt pretty bad. And my self-esteem definitely took a hit. You know, whatever had started to build up, whatever confidence I'd started to have, really kind of went back to zero, basically. Um, and those friends that I mentioned from freshman year who had tried to warn me about him, they kind of, you know, drifted away as a result of all this because I was hanging out with my ex and then with this other guy so much. And I, I, I somewhat blame myself for that. Obviously, I wasn't hanging out with them in the way that I had been. But those friendships were never the same after after that after that relationship, and um, and it really left me in this place of like nobody's ever going to want me again. This it's over, and now what? Now I'm back to being you know ugly, awful Amy. And I, I, am I ever going to be in a relationship again? What's going to happen? So I just wanted to feel like I, I that someone still thought that I was worth something. And again, seeking that from an external source instead of from within. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, and I want to mention this because this is a very great quote from Dr. Isabel Hanolt, who I've had the pleasure of meeting. She's a sexologist and she deals especially with sexuality and, and the autism spectrum. And she said in her book, Asperger's Syndrome and Sexuality from Adolescence to Adulthood, some women with AS accept all sexual offers in an attempt to obtain affection and intimate contact. And some people take advantage of their naivete and vulnerability. Um, and this is very, very true. And what was happening in the wake of this breakup was that I was extremely vulnerable. I didn't have the tools and the ability to recognize how vulnerable I was, however, at the time. 
I know that now, having gone through it again, that in the, in the wake of a breakup, that's probably when I'm at my most vulnerable. And so I was obviously open to things that perhaps I would not otherwise have been open to. Um, and one thing in particular that comes to mind is that there was this guy, again, he lived in, the, in that same dorm that I was in. And he, I'd had a crush on him, you know, on and off since freshman year, actually. He was in the year ahead of me. And we, we would do this thing where he would lay in his bed late at night. He would leave his dorm room door open and uh, pretend that he was sleeping, even though he wasn't. And I would go in, the TV would usually be on, and I would do things to him. And I, and I thought at the time, oh, it's this game, you know, that we're, we're playing. And he, you know, I remember he had these SpongeBob bed sheets that were just, you're in college, why do you have SpongeBob bed sheets? Um, but uh, so we would do this. And what I have come to find out all these years later that I didn't obviously know at the time is that he, uh, he was convicted of having child pornography on his computer and uh, soliciting two 14 year olds at a school where he worked. And you all saw that picture of me from when I started college. That's me at 18, but I certainly didn't look 18. I would say I probably look closer to 14, probably, maybe 13. And I can't get the thought out of my head that I was some kind of proxy. You know, I'm probably wrong on this, but there's this guilt that lays on me when I think about that, when I think of the stuff that I did with him. Fortunately, again, we did not have intercourse, but the fact that you know, this was happening, and, and I know what I thought in my head it was, that I thought it was this kind of thing that we were in on together, that we were on the same level about, but who knows what the thought in his mind was? Like, who really knows what he was getting out of it, what he was thinking of? And it just creeps me out. It makes me so uncomfortable to this day, and I'm, I'm hoping that it wasn't what my mind is telling me it is. But again, you see me go into that place of, it's my fault. There's something wrong with me. I did something wrong. No, if he's the one with those freaky thoughts in his head, those disturbing thoughts, that's him. That's his problem, not mine. And I have to remind myself of that. It's, it's hard not to. But so in that moment, in, in being vulnerable from, from being dumped, I wanted to you know, feel sexually desirable again. I wanted to feel attractive. And I was perhaps going into these wrong places looking for that validation. And that was certainly one of them. Um, and so what I started you know, doing after the breakup was looking again for that connection, looking for that validation. Um, I did have a few friends with benefits friends, which was a new arrangement to me. Um, they, you know, they do say that it can be hard for women especially to do the friends with benefits thing because we tend to develop an emotional connection. But I, I was able to you know, relatively keep it at bay in the sense of this guy that I started you know, kind of hooking up with. Um, we came close to beginning dating and then we didn't. And I, I still don't know exactly why that happened. But um, I just thought, no, I, I don't want to get in a relationship again. It's, I don't want to get hurt again. So I, I, I limited myself to these kind of one-off connections. And they weren't with strangers, mind you. They were with people that I knew. But it certainly wasn't a case of me making the best choices that I've ever made. Um, and. Yeah, you know, there are guys that I think back on that I had, you know, and of course it's college. Plenty of people ha look back and cringe, but boy, do I cringe with some of them. Um, I, I used to participate in what's called LARPing, live action role playing, and one of them was up in Massachusetts. And I remember some of the guys I met there, I, I had a few little hookups with, and th there was this one guy, remember I said that my ex was like a cheetah pet? Well, this guy was like a Yeti. And, and God help me, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, another guy was just really weird, and I, I look back on that and still don't know what I was thinking. But the thing is, is that even though I d these things happen, and maybe I, you know, I, it's not that I necessarily regret them, but I made some mistakes, but I learned from these mistakes. I'm able to look back and say, okay, yeah, maybe I didn't make the best choices, but now I understand why I made them and what I can do to keep myself from making them again in the future. So. I try not to have too many regrets, but one or two of those, oh boy, you know, I'm, I'm much more particular now about who I let touch me and let be in that inner sanctum, as it were. 
uh, literally and figuratively. Whew. And so I definitely <laughs> was looking for love in all the wrong places. I mean, it wasn't just with guys in real life, but also online. I would talk to guys and they would ask me, you know, to send nude photos or videos of me masturbating or whatnot. And, and I would, even though sometimes I didn't really care to. I thought, well, this is what they want and, and they won't like me or they'll stop talking to me if I don't. I, that's what I was afraid of. I didn't have that sensibility to say, well, if they stop talking to you because you won't send them that, they're not worth talking to. You know, that's what I wish I would have told myself or known back then. But um, I felt obligated to, to do this. And it lets you, you know, that's, that's a whole other story on, on top of that. But I came across some of the pictures. You know, I found them on my computer recently. And I just, I might be like, oh, Amy, you know, you didn't have to do that. You don't have to do this. Like, I can see the desperation in them. I can see, you know, I'm trying to pose and I'm trying to look sexy or whatnot. And it's really hard to do when you're like a negative A cup and you're just like, you know, the most awkward, gangly little thing. Um, because, you know, the thing I've come to learn also as I've gotten older is that the best way to look good naked is to feel good about yourself. It doesn't matter what you weigh. It's all in how you feel about yourself. And so even though I weighed less back then than I do now, I think I look far better now than I did back then. And I just wish that I hadn't been so desperate and looking for that validation from an outside source at that time. And I know that's what I was doing because I was afraid that nobody would ever want me. Um, so... You know, that was a tough thing. And, but part of what helped me to move past some of that masturbation, like I say, when, when you're in high school, you know, you get taught sex ed, and all you ever hear is that this is something that guys do. Um, you never hear about it in the context of women doing it. And the thing that was so important about learning how to do that, which I finally did the summer before my senior year of college, was that I could suddenly be the provider of my own enjoyment. I didn't have to rely on a guy for my orgasms. You know, self-serve is way different than full serve. I'm just saying. We live in New Jersey, okay, and you know, we go to somewhere where you pump your own. I'm telling you, it's different. And uh, <laughs> so it, it really was an eye-opener because I was suddenly able to realize how I experienced, but I, you know, up until that point, like with my ex, I, you know, I would ask him, well, do I enjoy this? Do, do I like this? Because I, I was so unaware of my own body and my own self that I had to ask him. And it's like, nobody lives in my body but me. I have to know my body. I have to know myself, what I'm okay with, what I'm not okay with. I have to learn what those boundaries are and what I want. And it took a long time to, you know, be able to do that. So, and the start of that really was masturbation. Um, and also, I never felt a sense of shame in doing it. I felt a sense of, am I doing this right? That feels weird. Is that broken? What the hell? I mean, but shame was something that I only felt when other people acted like I was supposed to feel ashamed of something. To me, shame doesn't come naturally. Um, my whole experience, you know, through high school and even in college was that I only felt ashamed when somebody would, you know, put me down or would say something and point out something. But it, it doesn't come naturally to me, like I said. So I had no qualms about exploring this part of myself and this was how I was starting to kind of feel inside, you know, walking with my head held high. Like, this was, this was what I needed to have in me, and, and this is just when it was really beginning. It, you know, it, I wasn't fully at this point yet. I, I, I didn't have the haters gonna hate mentality yet, but I, I was starting to have the spring in my step a little bit. But it, it was a process, and it certainly took time, and it certainly didn't finish by the end of college. You know, college was kind of a bridge to where I am now. But um, it really was a huge thing to be looking for that validation from myself instead of from someone else. I was just beginning to tap into that, and it was definitely a game changer. Um, so I just want to mention also about gender, because this was a part of the process too. Um, as I had said earlier, I, I often read the male-male fiction because I didn't understand how to act like a woman. I didn't feel like I could play the role of woman. And I, at one point, I remember expressing to my boyfriend that I wanted to cut off my breasts and I wanted to feel what it was like to have a penis. And he got very angry at this and, you know, told me that it was disgusting and all that other stuff. And, it, you know, I'm, I don't consider myself transgendered or, or bi-gendered or anything like that. But it was just something that I was going through because of, of the frustration I felt with what I was expected to do and look like and be and, and couldn't. And obviously that was magnified further when he dumped me because he wanted, quote, a real woman. So 
what you know I had I had this feeling of I just can't do this I can't be this well, you know I had to discover what it meant to be a woman for me I had to learn that myself you know nobody can tell you to be the kind of person you are no one can tell you how to be the kind of woman that you're going to be but it took a lot of time to to, to learn that and I just want to make it clear that any sexual orientation or gender identity you find in neurotypical people also exists in people on the autism spectrum. So even though what I went through was kind of more of a phase, there are folks for whom it's not a phase, who truly are either you know, transgendered or bisexual or asexual or whatever it may be. Whatever you see in folks who are neurotypical, you see in people on the autism spectrum. And we need to be able to explore those facets of ourselves and be free to be ourselves just as much as other people do. So some of the other things that, um, you know, boy, I'm sure you're all tired of the sex talk by now. I've been going on for a while. And, um, but I, I just wanted to highlight a few of the other challenges that uh, students on the spectrum can and do face in a college setting. Uh, bullying. You know, I was fortunate from my experience that even though I was bullied all through high school, I was not really bullied in college, at least not in a way that maybe I recognized like the bullying I experienced in high school. People, people do become a little more subversive in college. They, they kind of become more passive aggressive and uh, I'm from New York. I'm anything but passive aggressive. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think of you. That's it. You know, I say what's on my mind. And, but then I encounter people in college who aren't like that. You know, people who had agendas that perhaps were not the agendas I believed that they had. But bullying can happen. Um, at the hit by students, and it can happen also, unfortunately, by professors and staff. And I'm not saying that anybody sets out to bully someone, but when you're on the autism spectrum, people sense that kind of innate vulnerability and that innate you know, quality to a person who has trouble fitting in, who is perhaps not as socially adept as their peers. And there are just certain people in the world, whoever they may be, who are gonna pick on someone who's like that, who are gonna zero in on somebody who is different and and go after them. Um, so certainly, folks on the spectrum do face bullying in college, but may not even be able to recognize it or be able to report it to someone or, or figure out how to handle it. Um, and, and as a result, either of the bullying or just of other issues, a lot of students on the spectrum can end up being very isolated. Um, when you don't know how to connect socially with people, when you don't know how to ask someone on a date or be, you know whatever it may be, it, it can be hard to make those connections, and so it's just easier to not try at all than to keep getting rejected over and over again. Um, but this can definitely lead to a sense of isolation. You know, you, whenever you watch a movie about college, like, well, Animal House is a poor example, but any movie that's not Animal House, you get the sense that college is this communal experience and everybody is in this. But when you're someone who has difficulties socially and who can't necessarily connect with other people easily, that, that's not your experience. You're kind of on the fringes of all that. And you can feel very left out when you can't participate in these activities that other people are participating in. Um, but it just means finding out ways to connect that work for you. It doesn't mean necessarily going to all the things that other people do. Like, I remember going to a party in my freshman year. I thought, oh, this is it. You know, people in college, they go to parties. And <laughs> I go to this party on, on campus. I still remember it was, it was in this building next to Gonda's, I believe. And I walk in. I'm there for five minutes, and I'm like, hmm, this isn't really for me. You know, cause people are smoking, and I, I can't stand cigarette smoke. And it's loud, and you know, I went with a girl who was in my in my dorm building, but I thought, no, this isn't right for me. So I left, and nobody was coming down on me. Nobody was telling me, oh, what's wrong with you? Why won't you stay? I just left. I, it wasn't right. So. It, coming out of that isolation and finding ways to connect is contingent on what works for you and what's right for you. But sometimes folks on the spectrum, because of our challenges, we need you know, more help with that, and with coming out of that isolation. Um, anxiety and depression. If you are being bullied, if you are isolated from people on, in college, um, you, you can definitely have a lot of anxiety and sometimes depression. Um, a lot of people on the spectrum have coexisting conditions. You know, uh, besides being autistic, someone may have OCD or elements of ADD or, like I say, anxiety or depression. And these these things can make it even harder to you know function and be present um, in in a college setting. 
So, and when, when you are anxious, when, when just the thought of going to the cafeteria to eat, for example, fills you with anxiety, or going, going to class, trying to talk to your professor fills you with anxiety, it's very hard to have a positive college experience. Um, when you try to engage with people socially and they don't seem to really be interested, they you know, don't, don't respond in the way that you would have hoped, that can create a sense of anxiety and depression, certainly. So, and, and being on the spectrum, I, and I speak from my experience, I know that if, if I had a negative experience, if something happened, like a social encounter went wrong, I would spend the next four days going over it in my head over and over and over. Um, that, that sense of perseveration, that sense of needing to analyze it from every angle. Part of that is autism, part of that's just me. I'm an over-analytical person, but it can be very hard to snap out of that and to move on to the next thing when you are so fixated on trying to understand what went wrong with this thing because you don't want it to repeat. But part of the problem is that if a situation varies even slightly from the last one that went wrong, it's hard to apply, okay, you know, this is what I learned in this thing, I can apply it to this thing. No, because it's not the same. So it can be very hard to apply skills learned from one situation to another if there's any difference. Um, and then something else that folks on the spectrum can struggle with is self-care and hygiene. Um, up until I went to college, I didn't know how to run my own shower. <laughs> my dad would run my shower for me. Um, I remember senior year of high school, we went on this Habitat for Humanity trip, or maybe it was junior year, and I, I didn't take a shower the whole weekend, and my the roommates were not having it. They were like calling me names. They were angry, angry at me for not showering. I don't know why this is an anger-worthy offense, but... Um, and because of other problems on the trip, I was banned from future Habitat for Humanity trips. Or I, it was either Habitat or Peer Advisement Club, it was one of those. But I was banned, literally. Um, and so it's very important to have those skills. You have to be able to, to take a shower, to be able to get dressed, to know how to put on deodorant, or how to, to just how to take care of yourself. And when you are someone who has you know, had that support in place, has had your parents doing these things for so long, it's very hard to be able to develop a regimen of self-care when you haven't had that experience, that practice before. So, and then when, and if you're somebody then who doesn't know how to take care of themselves, then you become the smelly guy. Nobody wants to hang out with the smelly guy. All right, I, I mean, and it's sad to say, but it's true. And if you're a smelly girl, forget it. It's even worse as, as a girl. I mean, are girls allowed to smell like anything other than a freaking vase of flowers? No. Um, so it's, it's that kind of, Detriment, that kind of difficulty with self-care creates a lot of social stigma in students on the spectrum and it differentiates them even more from their peers in college. So I want to give you just a couple strategies that I think might help with dealing with some of the issues that I mentioned. Um, I don't know, are any folks here working in a support office, disability office, anybody here works with people, with students on the spectrum? Anyone? Okay. We have parents here also? Parent? Okay. Who am I missing? What other, do we have other professionals here working at the school? Instructors. Instructors. Okay. Okay. So, so here's some some thoughts that I have that you know may may help. Um, talk to the student first and foremost. It's very easy to look at someone and think that everything's fine on the surface, but it may not be. And I always tell people when it comes to individuals on the spectrum, you have to look for what's not there. You have to look for what you're not seeing, rather than what you are seeing. So. If you have a student coming in who you know is on the spectrum, you want to be able to be a resource for them. You want them to feel comfortable talking to you when they have an issue in class. And so the best way to do that, well, first of all, is to educate yourself. Learn about autism. Learn from other individuals on the spectrum, like me. You're here today, so you're already well ahead of the game. Good job. Um, learn from other people and learn what your student might be dealing with and then figure out a way to communicate with them. It may not be the traditional way of communicating that you think of. Like, Let's say you have a student who really doesn't, doesn't like sitting in a chair across from a desk. It's very intimidating for them. Go walk with them on the campus. Maybe they feel better if they're side by side with you and they can walk in the open air and, and they can gather their thoughts without having to feel like they have to make that eye contact. Because you know, for a lot of folks on the autism spectrum, eye contact is very challenging. And that's often expected in those office situations. So breaking out of that, finding an environment that works maybe better for that student is definitely a good strategy to look at using. Um, 
and look at what's been successful in the past, if you can. Um, if there's something that's worked for this student before, if they can tell you of something that has helped them in high school, try to incorporate that into the strategies that you're doing now. And, and look at the student's strengths and interests. That is a huge one. Um, all too often, professor, okay, sorry. All too often, uh, people will, will, will try to use strategies that are things that they've used before, but when it comes to students on the spectrum, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. You, you, you can't use the same thing from student to student, necessarily, because what worked for one student will not work for another. So look at that, that student as a human being, a fully realized person who's not just a collection of symptoms, but a young person who is struggling with the same things that many other students in college are struggling with. And, and look at what their interests and their passions are and use that to create strategies to help them succeed and thrive in college. Um, and for other students, here are some, you know, some things that other neurotypical students can do to help the autistic student maybe adjust a little bit more. Keep, keep the student up to date with what's going on. If there's some kind of club meeting or some event happening on campus, they're not gonna know if they don't know what's happening. Um, you know, not everybody's tapped into the campus email necessarily or to where updates might be posted. I know it, it might be a little different now than when I was in college. I was in college and you know, I started in 2001, so the internet stuff wasn't as prevalent as it is now with, with notifications and things like that. But keep, keep the person you know, aware of, of what's happening. Um, Go with them if, if you may need to, you know, and, and I know a lot of people, and I agree, rail against the idea of creating like a buddy system because you don't want it to be an artificial construct of a friendship. You want it to be a genuine friendship. And sometimes that can be, you know, a difficult thing to cultivate, but if it starts off with something like that, it can grow into a genuine friendship. But you have to reach out to someone because sometimes you're dealing with students who might have trouble reaching out themselves. So if you can be a person that they can talk to, be that safe space for them. And when I say a safe space, because a safe space isn't just a physical location, it's actually just a person or anything that a person can feel comfortable around and can be themselves around. <clears throat> if you are that safe space for a student, You'll, you will change their life. You'll, you, will make, you will ensure that they have a much better experience in college than, than if you weren't. Um, so th these are just a few ideas. You know, every college is different. I know, I'm not sure if you guys have dorms. Here's a community college. I don't think you have dorms, right? Okay. So, but, and they, that makes it even harder with, with, a, with a commuting environment. Oh boy. I, you know, I, I, I haven't gone to a community college myself, so I, I know it's a different experience, I imagine. But finding ways, yeah, finding ways to reach out to people um, can, can really just be an impactful thing that you can do uh, and can really be the start of genuine and, and long lasting friendships. So, th those are some, some thoughts that, of what might be useful. So what can you do? What can you do to empower students on the autism spectrum? Remember a few important things. Yes, we are different from our neurotypical compatriots, but we have just as many similarities to them as we do differences. If you look at someone who is autistic and all you're seeing is the autism, you're missing a whole lot of the picture, as I've said before. Um, it is, you know, part of who the student is, but it, it's not something that defines who that person is. It, it's like if you had a student who had, I don't know, well, this is extreme, but cancer. You're not going to be looking at that person as cancerous or as a cancer person. They're, they're, they're a person, first and foremost, and they happen to have cancer. You know, it doesn't define, that's a really bad example, I'm sorry. But you know what I'm saying. Um, so, you, you know, it, it happens too often that we want to isolate and kind of cordon off students on the spectrum and say that they fit into this category and that. And, and that creates problems of its own because in the, in the greater world, when, when students go out into the world when they finish college, we're all in this crazy mess together. There's not like a special roped off section for disabled people, you know what I mean? We have to learn how to live in the world. And, that, and those skills and, and the things that we need to live in the world start in college. They, well, they start far before then, but they happen a lot in college too. So it's just important to remember that the person needs to be part of the community of college, the community of community college, um, and not just you know, existing in their own bubble, but part of a greater whole. Um, 
treat autistic students like other students. And now that means a couple things. I've seen all too often it happen where a parent or someone will say, well, he's autistic, it's not his fault. He, you know, no, 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 no. In this world, there are jerks. And jerks are jerks whether or not they're autistic, neurotypical, whatever it may be. If somebody is engaging in bad behavior, they need to be called out on it, whether or not they're autistic, but especially if they're autistic and not, perhaps may not understand that what they're doing is inappropriate or may cause serious problems down the line. So you have to not be afraid to, to really tell someone like it is. And I don't mean you want to necessarily hurt somebody's feelings, because obviously you don't, but you have to be willing to be upfront. Um, and at the same time, you want to remember too that yes, they are on the spectrum, and it, it is a component. It is something that brings with it challenges and and difficulties. But it's something to be worked with, not worked around. It's something to be incorporated and used as an asset instead of seen as just a liability. So I'm just I'm trying to encourage you to really take that fully rounded approach to looking at students who are on the autism spectrum, and change your own perceptions of autism. Very often, professionals, people who work with or teach individuals on the spectrum, look at those students based on what their ideas of autism are, what they know about autism. So if you have a certain negative conception of it, that's how you're gonna see that student. So it's important to be informed, really, of what autism is and what autism isn't. What autism is the cause of and what it's not the cause of. Um, and you can do that, like I said, by listening to people like me and by educating yourself and having you know, knowledge about what it means to live life on the autism spectrum. And when you do that, when you, when you change your preconceived perceptions of autism, then you're, you're much better equipped to work with autistic students and to offer them the kind of support that they really need. So this is my contact information. I have cards and brochures if anybody wants one. Um, and now we'll go to questions. And thank you all so much. And you can ask anything that you like. Yes. Can you, my son has a diagnosis on the autism spectrum. He's, you know, he's classified as PDD-NOS, so he has a diagnosis on the autism spectrum. He struggles with friendships, which I, when you were talking about that, um, and uh, you know, right now he's insulated in his school district among the eighth graders. And, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think he ever sees in his mind the fact that there's something beyond eighth grade, and that mm -hmm. at some point he will branch out into the world and meet people who are very similar to him. Do yeah. you have any advice that I could tell him? Um. Well, on the one hand, I think you know, being 14 years old is that time for being in that bubble and kind of feeling safe, because he's going to have plenty of more years to not feel safe and to be out in the big scary world. Um, on the other hand, you know, yeah, it's it's important to to make sure that people understand you are going to meet people who are different from you and who may not like the same things that you like, and. Just as you liking something that someone else doesn't like doesn't make you a bad person, them not liking something that you like doesn't make them a bad person. So just, you know, kind of you, using the idea of perspective taking, which is something that individuals on the spectrum struggle with, having them kind of take the perspective of like, you know, if you were this person, would you want someone to not want to be friends with you just because they don't like Pokemon or whatever it is, you know, kind of using that as a way to, to, in, to at, the, at least at this age, to show him that there are different kinds of people in the world. Could be a good start. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Uh, first here, and we'll go here. Go ahead. Um, you had said a lot of things you referenced back then, I didn't know, but now I do know. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it's just years and maturing you got that, or were there specific ways you learned? Uh, trial and error, mostly error. Um, Definitely maturity, definitely time. You know, it's, it, I wish I could say that there was some strategy I learned or something that someone taught me that opened all the doors of perception, but it just doesn't work that way. And I never took acid, so that wasn't one of them either. You know, I just had to, I had to grow up a little bit and I had to really grow into myself more than anything. Um, I had to gain confidence in myself and be, you know, feel that I'm a worthy person, a person worth being treated in, in a certain way, being treated better than perhaps I let myself be treated before. And, you know, 
yeah, it really, it really was just a function of kind of time and just g gaining, gaining experience, I would say. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes. Um, in dealing with relationships, you had talked about um, you know, the influx of the internet and social situations, and now that's you know, just really how a lot of young adults connect now. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the best way to guide a young adult be, to understand the adult on the spectrum? understand the difference between a virtual relationship and friendship mm -hmm. and a uh, connected um well, I want, I want to caution people against thinking that online friendships are somehow less valid or less real than in-person ones, because that's simply not true. Okay. Um, the, the friendships that I developed at a younger age, when I was around 14, and I, I started talking to, to, to girls online in the Backstreet Boys chat room. That's where I met people. And I'm still friends with some of those girls to this day. So those, those, and those friendships were what I needed to survive, what I needed to get through these very difficult times that I was going through. And if my parents, you know, had said to me, it's not really like a real friendship because it's online, I would have been devastated to hear that because to me it was very real. To me it was a connection that I formed with someone and just because I can't see them physically every day doesn't mean that it's any less valid to me. Um, but as time went on, you know, I like to say that I used to use the internet for finding friends, now I use the internet for keeping in contact with the friends I meet in real life. But that, that happened over time. It happened with finally being around people who were more accepting of people who were different and people who accepted me for who I was. So, you know, I, w I would say it's important to not put down those online friendships. Um, and I mean, obviously there's issues of safety and, and all that and things like that. Um, but that's, I think that's a whole like separate thing. But if we're talking about like same sex friendships or whatnot, those are, are very important and shouldn't be, I don't think diminished for people who maybe have a harder time making those connections face to face. And maybe the face to face will come along later on. So you're welcome. Any other questions? You can ask anything, I don't mind. Obviously I'll talk about anything. Yes. Well, yeah, well that, that's the whole thing of it really is, you know, I do full presentations on autism and sexuality, my, my, all my experiences, and people come up to me and they're like, you know, I'm not autistic, but I totally related to that, that totally, ha so, so the benefit is to the neurotypical folks who want to think that being autistic makes you so different from everyone else, but what I use my story to do is to show that we are a lot more alike than we are different, and that yeah, that much of the, many of the things that autistic folks go through are in college, for instance, are what neurotypical people go through. It's just that we may not have those innate coping skills and abilities to handle these situations the way that a neurotypical person would. But absolutely, sharing my story has been very liberating. Um, I, I, you know, I've always felt free to talk about this kind of thing about sex. I call myself the Dr. Rose of the autism world because I'm five feet tall and I talk very openly about these things, as I say. So it's needed. It, it, we need openness on the subjects. We live in a kind of a puritanical society and that is to nobody's benefit as far as I'm concerned. So it's important to have these conversations and these discussions and I find that more so with every presentation that I give. So any other questions? Did you address earlier how you got into public speaking and doing hmm. No, no, that's fine. Well, um, I, I started speaking at conferences when I was 14. Uh, my mother is on the board of AHA, which is an autism organization on Long Island, and they have an annual conference. And I, I got my start kind of there on a teen panel that they had. And then at the age of 14, I spoke at a MAP conference in Indiana on another panel. Um, and it just sort of went from there. Uh, the, the sexuality stuff didn't come until the last few years. You know, I started ASCOT coaching in 2010 when I got my uh, college coaching certification at Bank Street College in New York City. And I wanted to be a college coach. That's what I was looking to do. But then I started doing these presentations and just found that there was just so much more of a need for that than for the college. Because a lot, lot, lot of people are doing the college thing, but not a lot of people are doing the um, sexuality thing. So the presentations I give have been on different subjects. You know, I talk a lot about, about my experience growing up on the spectrum. I talk about girls and autism because that's also something that desperately needs to be addressed. 
And, and I do talk about transition stuff, obviously, but then the sexuality thing has really what has taken off over the past few years. So that's kind of, and then the, the big moment for me was in 2011, I spoke at the United Nations on World Autism Awareness Day. Um, I was on a panel and that was really amazing being on kind of a world stage. And so it's just been, it's been just going up and up ever since then, so. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you.